Hopefully everyone can hear me okay this morning. Actually, I need to go that way with it. What a blessing it is to be here on the Sabbath, to be able to, to be up here in front, despite sometimes I get a little butterflies in my stomach, especially when I know there's visitors here. You know, you're never sure exactly um, how the message is going to be received, but I pray that the Holy Spirit actually does all the speaking here this morning and not myself. Um, I pray before I pre- you present messages, and, and usually if I, if the impression is to, to speak about a topic, I might have already spoke about it, and so I usually will pull it out, read it, and make sure it's appropriate for the time that um, you know, we're in. The last several years have been quite tumultuous for many of us. Um, you know, we're still kind of feeling the effects of some of the, the, the COVID situation, you know, it's, everything's by and large open, but it, it has changed society in the way we interact with one another and the way that we do business or the way that we live our lives still. And so when, I'm, when I was reading Colossians um, chapter 1, I actually wanted to read 9 through 12 real quick with you because these verses, um, they're just beautiful and they speak to me in, in a very personal way. Verse 9 says, For this reason we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you, and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthening with all might according to his glorious power for all patience and long, long suffering with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. Just beautiful verses about the Lord and what he does for us and what he wants for us and then our um, our response, being fruitful in every good work. So we're going to talk about that a little bit when we get started. But let's pray again uh, before I begin too, too far into this. Father, Lord, I pray that, Lord, you hide me behind the cross today. May you be lifted up. May your words be spoken today. May your Holy Spirit speak to each of us individually in the words that our heart needs to hear. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. So, stagnant. What does that mean? Right? When I say the word, I'll bet an image comes to mind, right? Um, but the definition from, I think this was Webster, was showing no activity, dull and sluggish. I think a biblical definition would be going through life with very little thought to God's work or reliance on him. Reminds me when I was younger, when living in the mountains of Colorado, we'd go hiking in the mountains, and you'd come across these pools, some of them quite large, they look like little ponds, right? And the setting is beautiful, there's trees, and the water looks so clean and clear, but it's not. It's, uh, it's usually full of nasties that'll make you sick. Um, even being in the high mountains, right, snow melt and such, the pond, the little the stagnant ponds get warm, and then they breed bacteria and bugs and all that and things. And um, it just, although it looks good on the outside, it's sometimes not good on the inside. I've had unfortunate personal experience from drinking that water. But here in Oklahoma, we get that too. We Like today, it rained this morning and driving in, there were stagnant pools everywhere. You know, mosquitoes love those stagnant pools and breed and then you get just, it becomes oppressively warm and and then you got to stay inside because the bugs are too bad. There's a couple years ago we had an instance, two instances that I can remember. There was um, a splash pad down on Riverside, and it got warm, and a lot of people were in the splash pad, and there was a lot of standing water around the outside, and it bred a very particular form of amoeba, and a young child contracted that amoeba and died. It happened again at uh, the park just outside of the zoo. Same thing, hot day. Lots of people at the splash pad, and there was a very, I remember seeing the pond, because we were there that weekend, that, that there were so many people there, a very big pool had formed, and the kids were just running through it and splashing, the water slightly warm, you know, it's kind of like bath water, again, special kind of amoeba, a young child contracted it and died. Stagnation can be a killer, not just physically, but spiritually. So I want to ask you a question. Those of you that are here today or those of you that might be watching online, I want to welcome you. Those of you that are watching online, we wish you were here, but we understand and we appreciate you joining us. But those who might be watching this later, the same question is posed to you. Have we here 
not just here, but in the Seventh-day Adventist church, have we stagnated? We thought Jesus would come already. Have we become dull and sluggish, showing little or no activity? Have we embraced our Laodicean moniker as a badge of honor? We're the Laodicean church, mentioned in the Bible. Or is it a shield that we're the Laodicean church so we don't have to do anything? I think we, we did for a time, you know, as we tried to understand how to get our, our youth involved. The youth were leaving the church in droves. Like the back door was wide open and there was a picnic out back. They were just leaving. And so we've changed our methods and some of the focus we've got to try to keep our youth in our church, involving them because the young people have so much energy that some of us don't anymore. And so I like to think of myself as a young person. The gray gives it away. But we've also uh, transitioned our services and our outreach activities to use current technology. I don't think there's a church out there, there's probably a few, who don't have some form of live stream or some form of digital evangelism going on where they try to reach the community or reach out to people and share the message. So I think, in a way, we've turned the corner, by and large. And I say that because this, just this morning I was reading one of our magazines. There's a huge focus on personal evangelism, personal work but doing it in the way Jesus did it, following his methods, not in the way that we want to do it, the way that's comfortable for us, but actually following his example. How many of you are comfortable walking up and talking to a stranger? Six of us, seven of eight, okay, eight people comfortable talking to a stranger. His method was to go and mingle among people, not to evangelize them, but to desire their good, to want to help them to be better at their life and whatever it was, health or just living a better life. He didn't preach to them as much as he did try to help them and heal them. So that's why we are doing much the same thing here, having this event in August through several weeks after to try to help people. Diabetes is a terrible disease in our country and it's getting worse. So we're trying to desire their good at a location that's not the church, it's less threatening, fewer people are... Um, you know, they don't always like to come to church. When we had the storm a few weeks back and we had that very weekend an outreach opportunity um, for finance to try to help people with their finances, right? Student loan debt is crushing people or debt in general. I think some of the statistics are staggering as to the debt people are under. The Bible tells us not to be a borrower or lender. If we give something, we give it freely expecting nothing in return, but that's not always the case with banks and such. And so people need help. But the storm just totally canceled all plans there was no power at the building, so we brought it here to the church, and unfortunately, not a single community member came. So we know we have to change our methods, change our, our opportunities, and this, this material I was reading this morning was just encouraging people to go be his hands and feet in the community, desiring their good. And it was talking about some of the things that had happened as a result of that. And praise the Lord that that's why I think we've turned the corner. We've, we've adjusted our, our way of reaching people in outreach, that it's not about bringing them here. It's about meeting them there and sharing with them the gospel so that the Lord can do his work. We may never see the fruits of the work we do. The, the pamphlets or the material we give, they may never come here. But we've done the work and then the Holy Spirit gets to do the final transformation of the heart. We may not see the work until that day when he comes back. However, I also believe the devil would love us to just see the difficulties within the church the struggles we still have. We are the remnant church. And the devil doesn't like that. He wants to divide us and conquer. He wants us to see the differences of our opinions and the sins of our brothers and sisters. He wants to alienate one another and for us to be critical of each other. He wants us to be stagnant in our walk with the Lord or even possibly go backwards. So we're going to look at a couple examples of what stagnation is in a person's life so we can kind of understand the danger. So the first one I want to point out here is um, success can make a person stagnant. If you have no adversity or struggle in your life uh, to make improvements or to be better, it can make you complacent, right? No adversity, you feel, whoo, I'm comfortable, I've got it made, everything's great. But if you remember, if you know, diamonds are formed by heat and pressure. So if we want to be gems in his crown, do you think we should probably experience or maybe we should be doing something in our life that is a little difficult, puts us in a position where we're not always comfortable. 
when I saw the few hands of people saying they were comfortable with going and talking to people, maybe it's me not talking. Maybe that's what I have to do. Just be there and live it. Because sometimes my mouth gets ahead of my brain. But those of you who aren't comfortable talking to people, there's an opportunity there. There's an, there's an opportunity to reach someone like you who maybe doesn't experience that, um, or maybe I should reword it, maybe they experience a level of discomfort when someone comes and talks to them. You know how you would like to be reached. You know how someone of your uh, personality wants to be talked to or, or in- engaged. Pray for the Lord to show you how to reach someone who's also like you. There's a lot of people in this world who I think get overlooked because they're quiet. And some of those folks are the most observant, the most uh, conscientious people. I live with one of them, my wife, with my kids at certain points. Very observant of people. There's an opportunity. Steel is forged and it's made stronger by heat and hammering blows. That's how you forge stronger materials through adversity. The opposite of adversity, though, or the opposite of success is adversity. It can make a person stagnant. It's too hard. Things are just so difficult. So I stop striving. I stop pushing and moving forward because things are hard. And then they, well, once things stop becoming hard, they stop. Ooh, the pressure's off. I'll just stay right here because I don't want to feel that pressure. I don't want to feel that discomfort. I don't want to be in a situation that makes me uncomfortable. There's also an opportunity to stagnate by being too busy. Have you ever tried to do too many things at once and none of them get done? Or at least none of them get done effectively or well? Do you feel fulfilled when you've rushed around and done things halfway? But yeah, I can check them off my list. Or you don't take the time to sit down and engage with someone personally, one-on-one, when you could have or when they asked. Too many irons in the fire, trying to keep too many balls in the air can make a person just hang in there, right? Hanging by their fingernails. They're just not making progress in any real direction. And so too busy can be stagnation as well. You might be saying to yourself, that covers pretty much everything in life. And that's true. Everything in life can make you stagnant. The devil, he's everywhere, trying to keep us off of the narrow way. He wants to stop our progress in our walk with the Lord. That's his desire. He doesn't want us saved, but he doesn't matter if we're here as long as we're not growing with the Lord because if you're not growing, you're stagnant or you're going backwards. You can probably think of other ways, you know, in life stagnation can happen. You might have been through different experiences than I just described, which put a, a, maybe a plateau in your walk with the Lord. But in these next examples we're going to talk about, I want you to think about how stagnation occurred in these events. I don't want to tell you how they occurred because that's my understanding. That's how the Lord has impressed me. But I want the Holy Spirit to impress you in your situation how these events were were stagnant. If you want to turn in your Bibles to 2 Kings, we're not going to read all of it because it's several chapters, 9 through 11. 2 Kings chapters 9 through 11. There's a story here. <clears throat> there's a story of some chaos that's happening. There's, there's tragedy. There's an event here. It's a power struggle in the, in the kingdom of Israel going on. If you glance at these few verses, maybe you've got headers of the different sections that kind of give you an idea of what's happening. Second Kings chapters 9 through 11. There's a new king in Israel. And he's got some events going. He ends up um, killing a couple kings. He's anointed in a, in a secret ceremony and then the actions that he performs next sets off a cascade of terrible events. After his coronation, he meets a man by the name of Joram. He was the reigning king in Israel and then along with uh, Ahaziah, the king of Judah, they come together and he ends up killing both of them in battle. In, verses, uh, 20, in chapter 9, verses 23 through 27, it says here, then Joram turned around and fled, said to Ahaziah, Treachery, Ahaziah. Now Jehu drew his bow at full strength and shot Jehoram between his arms and the arrow. I'll stop there. It's a bit graphic for the little ones. He dies. And 
But when Ahaziah, king of Judah, saw this, he fled by the road of Beth Hagan. So Jehu pursued him and said, Shoot him also. And they did. And so they, both of these kings perish. Something happens back at home. Ahaziah's mother learns of his death, and even terrible events happen. She begins to dis- dispatch his children. She wanted to eliminate all the successors to the throne. She wanted to rule. But we know from chapter 11 that Joash, who was one year old at the time, and he was also heir to the throne, he was secreted away to the temple by Ahaziah's sister along with the nursemaid to be raised in secret. I remember reading this story to the children when they were younger. It glosses over a lot of the previous events and what leads to it, but the Lord is trying to save an individual because he was going to do something. He's hidden in the temple for six years, and in those six years, he learns about the love of God through the tender mercies of the high priest, who is his uncle, Jehoiada. I think I'm pronouncing it correctly. I could be butchering it, but Jehoiada. He's taught and encouraged to learn and to ask questions in an environment crafted to prepare him to be the next king. He was not stagnant, but he was growing and learning. He knew that if he was spotted by anyone who was not faithful to God, that he'd be killed. So his development had a little bit of urgency. I imagine that at the age of seven, when he was crowned king, he was a little wise beyond his years. A one-on-one, everyday learning from the high priest and the others there about God and, and his message probably was wise beyond his years because I remember as a young person, I could remember things really easily. Phone numbers and dates and whatever. It's not as easy now. Maybe because my head is full of all kinds of stuff. There's no room to tuck it in. There's cubbies are very full. But as a young person, you can remember things very easily. But despite all of that, he still needed, and he sought out the counsel of his uncle, who was his, I guess, his spiritual advisor. Given the circumstances, Joash's development as a spiritual individual had been accelerated. If he was going to be king of God's people, he had better be connected to God. And after his coronation, at seven years old, immediately after he's crowned, They lead a charge and they do something his predecessors, several of the older kings, had never done. He destroyed the temple of Baal. It's a pretty good start to his reign, right? Getting rid of the idols, the the idolatry, drawing the people back. But he also noticed something in chapter 12. If you go to 2 Kings chapter 12. We see he begins um, to rebuild the temple. He notices it's run down. The, the worshipers of Baal had taken the stones from the temple to be used for their temple. It just, was, it just wasn't maintained well. Um, sometimes the, the, the um, condition of the heart is displayed by how well someone is taking care of the temple of the Holy Spirit. And so in chapter, in chapter 12, we see he begins to restore the temple and he, um, he sends out word to collect money. The priests are to go and collect money from the, the people to rebuild the temple and to either do the work themselves or to have it hired. But he notices, um, he looks around and he notices nothing has gotten done. And it wasn't like a couple weeks. 23 years had passed from his original decree to go and to try to gather money to rebuild the temple. 23 years. Nothing has gotten done. Very little has been done. It looks to me that potentially in those 23 years he became stagnant. Now the Bible tells us that he did what was right in the sight of the Lord. However, was he doing what was right in the sight of the Lord because his uncle was telling him what he should be doing, counseling him? And that's not a bad thing. That's why we have elders and pastors to help us to to learn and to grow and to do better things. But if we don't do it out of the love of Christ in our own heart, we might end up in that day when the Lord appears and we cry, Lord, Lord, didn't we do all of these things in your name? So what he does is, is in the children's story, you know, it shows them building a chest and they're drilling a hole in the top to collect the money so it can't be stolen and then they count it and they store it and they make sure that everything is accounted for. They basically created a treasurer for the church. Because what had been happening is they had been keeping the money for themselves. So he farmed out the work to the repair of the temple and, and it began to be, uh, to be done. 
So in that brief moment, he had a, a what I would call like a, a fresh wind of activity. He saw what needed to be done and he stepped in and he did it. It's like fresh water running into a puddle. When I was a young person and there used to be puddles, you know, and maybe there were a couple puddles connected and they would be relatively still. I would connect them with a stick. I'd drag it through the dirt and the mud and connect them to watch it flow and it, and it you know, makes the puddle bigger and it just kind of refreshes it. In my mind, I imagine something like that. He's got this fresh wind. He sees what's going on or what's not going on and decides to step in and do something about it. But later, this is why I think there was stagnation in his life, because later when his uncle dies, this guy, this, this spiritual leader, this man who he looked up to, who had saved him, had helped save him and raise him, when he passes away, he began to drift away from the Lord. He became stagnant, and he stopped moving and growing. And maybe, like I said, um, he had too many things going on when he was younger, when he was prosperous, and he didn't take that opportunity, or maybe it didn't settle in and become who he truly was. He ends up being drawn away by the princes of Judah into idol worship again. We read that in Second Chronicles chapter 24, verses 17 and 18. It tells us that. But in the end, he ends up doing something terrible. Idol worship had drawn him away from the true love of the Lord. He lost his first love. The man who had saved him and raised him and cared for him as his own, he kills his son. He murders the son of Jehoiada. He might have been like a brother to him. They kind of were maybe raised together a little bit, and then he ends up killing him. It got so bad that eventually his servants killed him. Joash's servants rose up and dispatched him and put his son on the throne. I point out this story because, you know, like the first 30 years of his life, he probably stayed connected through his association, his associations. But that wasn't sufficient to save him. His personal connection to God was linked to his uncle's spiritual life. At some point, he appears to become stagnant in his walk. The Bible tells us, like I said, he did right in the sight of the Lord while his uncle lived, but uh, maybe it wasn't because he wanted to. It was because he was told this is what you should do. As the king, you should do these things. Now, it doesn't tell us that in the Bible, but based on his fruit, you can connect dots. Now, with this story in mind, I want us to think about our Christian walk. When you first made the decision to follow the Lord, was it accepted by everyone you knew? Were they happy for you? We were just talking about this in my family the other day with my daughter. When we joined the church, we lost everything. Everything we thought was important to us. All of our friends. My parents quit talking to me. It's gotten better, much better than it was. But basically, we became alienated from everything that we knew, and it was probably for the best. Because if we had maybe kept those attachments, we might not have accepted the truth as readily as we did. The Sabbath, to me, was like, there it is. Okay. I accepted it quickly, easily. But we faced criticism. Did you face criticism? If you were born in the church, have you ever faced criticism for your, for your faith? Maybe it was in a job, or maybe it was in some work you were trying to do, and you someone who you tried to explain your faith to said you were in a cult. You heard that word tossed around a little bit. But did you learn new and wonderful things? I mean, the things that I've learned so far, I'm still growing and learning, but the things I've learned has just changed my life. If you knew who I was before, my wife can attest to this, and those of you who've heard my testimony, I was not a good person. And only through the miracle of the Lord, that's the only thing that could have changed me. I stand before you today. But I also discovered a new and loving family. We have very good friends here today who replaced the family members that we lost, who have lo I've looked up to as spiritual parents as they helped guide us through our journey and our walk. Without them, we probably would have fallen away. Through those times, you can begin to develop no matter how old you are, if you join the church as an older, older person and not a young person, you can always develop 
new character, new habits, new preferences. You can begin to have new activities. I'll come back to that point again here a little bit a little bit later. But let's look at another event from the Bible that was pivotal in the lives of some of those in the early church. So in your mind, picture the event. You know it well. <clears throat> Jesus is crucified. His followers, they're heartbroken. They're disheartened. They're not knowing what's, ha- what's going to happen next to them. They were afraid. They were fearful. Everything they had thought and believed, gone, changed. Their idea of the future, dashed. If you go to Luke chapter 24, that's where we're at. Luke chapter 24. They spent the Sabbath hiding, not worshiping. And they fell asleep that night, not wanting the next day to come. You ever had a terrible event, a tragedy in your life, and you just want to sleep and have it never, and wake up and have it never have happened? You hope it's just a bad dream, something just awful. That's them. They don't want the next day to come. In the morning, several women arise and they go to tend to the body of Jesus and they find his tomb empty, making a terrible situation even worse. It distresses them all greatly. And they went to share what they had learned with the disciples. They run back. 24 verse 9 it says, Then they returned from the tomb and told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. I can imagine the dismay. The Romans, they've taken him. I mean, they knew what they did. They put seal on the door. They put guards outside to try to prevent them from going and taking the body. And now the body's gone and they know they've not done it. The consternation of they can't even properly tend to their Lord's body. It was a hasty burial the day before. It wasn't, imp- it wasn't proper yet, so they wanted to do it right, and now they can't. If you drop down to verse 13, now behold, two of them were traveling this, uh, that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was seven miles from Jerusalem. So these two men arose, and they decided to travel that morning early before they, before they had known what had happened. Maybe it was to get away from all the mourning, right? If you're surrounded by too much distress, it can become overpowering and you you just can't function. And so they just, I don't know, maybe that was why. But they get up and they're leaving. They begin to walk. And they begin to talk with each other about all that had happened. Verse 14 says, and they talked together all these things which had happened. And verse 15, so it was while they conversed and reasoned with uh, reason that Jesus himself drew near and went with him. But their eyes were restrained so that they did not know him. Their situation, their misery, their conversation, their current predicament blinded them to who was walking with them. <clears throat> their preoccupation with their discussion and their, and their own ideas kept them from recognizing him. We should take note that this can happen in our own eyes, in our own lives. We can be so focused on our current situation and maybe the distress we're in that we forget to see that Jesus is with us. He's around us. There's beauty around us that we just sometimes don't see. If you don't get a chance, if you don't have a garden at home, growing flowers or vegetables, find a place that has growing things. Go there. Look at it. Experience the Lord through his nature. It's so refreshing. When I go to the garden after a long day, uh, there's just something about it. You know, even maybe if it's just taking care of the bugs, but just something about seeing creation happen. Because that's what it is. A little seed turns into a big old tomato or a beautiful flower. It's amazing to think about that. And the Lord can just work, work miracles on you if you're not so f- focused on your own feet. Does, does our preoccupation or our stagnation keep us from recognizing God in front of us? So Jesus asks them a question, which when I was thinking about this message and writing it, I had to ask the same thing to myself. What conversation is this that you have with one another as you walk and are sad? So 
So I ask myself, is my conversation or the thoughts of my mind, are they helping me or making me stagnant? Like I mentioned just a few moments ago, these past several years, they've taken a toll on us, on, our, on all of us. Maybe some of our churches have never returned to their former membership. There's people in this church that were here in January of 2020 that are not here today. They're, they're alive, but they're not here with us. They've never returned for whatever reason. It's not me to judge, but they're just not here. Life has changed us. We have lost friends and family members because of it as well. So our current situation can, help, can make us draw in and it becomes stagnant. But just one day before their lives, before his arrest, before the crucifixion, things were great, right? Jesus was alive. He was teaching. He was there directly in front of them. And now everything is different. Just a few simple hours can change the trajectory of people's lives so drastically. Ellen White tells us to consider the closing hours of Christ's life. Consider them, the perspective of the disciples and the apostles and the other followers, their perspective of the last few hours, replaying what just happened, replaying their own actions and what they did or what they didn't do. Their development in three and a half years of Christ's ministry, not stagnant, continuing to climb, although a little confused as to what was supposed to happen, but being that close to Jesus can't help but transform you. People would recognize the difference in them when they had been with Christ. The truths that they had learned is amazing spiritual growth, and then he died. They hit the proverbial wall. Their, their journey was interrupted. Their pool became stagnant. It's interesting to note that it's been almost exactly three and a half years since COVID, 2020. I think it was February when we really started, late January, early February, when we really started hearing news from different places in the world, places starting to shut down. I was on a trip from Salt Lake City on an airplane. And then shortly after that, um, everything shut down. No air, no air travel, no gatherings. No getting together. I mean, it was just like nothing. And now we're three and a half years later. Um, and that um, same amount of time where they were transformed so amazingly, we have been transformed. Those three and a half years changed the entire landscape of the world. It created a people, a very small group of people that were able to spread the gospel to the then known world. In that same amount of time, three and a half years, Satan has done the same thing, but in the opposite direction for our world. Force us to draw back, to not meet face to face, to not want to get together and have groups and gatherings and things like that. It's just become different. We'll pick up our story again. Jesus begins to talk to them, to expound on history and to talk about himself. Verse 27 and beginning in Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. And then they begin to remember and the development that they had, been, that they had um, been nurtured in them over the prior months and possibly even years. We don't know exactly how long these individuals were with him. It suddenly comes to life again. In that verse, verse 27, it's so short, but it's so long. In a Bible study in one verse, expounding to them all the prophets in Moses. Probably took them about two hours to walk the distance to Emmaus. If you walk three and a half miles an hour, that's about the average gait of a person. So seven, you know, two hours to travel seven miles. So in those two hours, they got an amazing Bible study. Jesus condensed what were the entirety of the biblical history into two hours. Then when they reached the village and convinced Jesus to eat with them, he re reveals himself to them. <clears throat> Imagine their lives. They joined up with Jesus some time back and learned things that were contrary to much of what they had believed, much of what they had held sacred. He pulled them out of stagnation. That's what the, the Jewish people were like, right? Well, I gave a message before, I don't remember exactly how far back it was, about how they were so afraid of being polluted by the world that they closed themselves off because they didn't want to go back into captivity. They didn't want to be idol worshipers again like they were before they went into captivity Babylon and so they were going to keep everyone away. They became stagnant as a people. They weren't doing his work. So this teaching that Jesus had pulled them out of that stagnation, showed them what they should be doing. 
They had become unpopular to many of their old friends. And what they learned began to change their lives and their characters. They beheld Christ himself firsthand. And they were changed. There was no stagnation there in their lives. But then the stressful events of the crucifixion had dashing their hopes, making them question, had they been right in believing what they had learned? Did they turn away? Did they lose people because of what had happened? I'm certain. <clears throat> the, uh, the challengers of losing their spiritual divisor, their Christ, messed with their mind and turned their thoughts upside down. By the grace of God, though, it was brief, just a couple days. But it changed how they remember or how they, they thought of the things he taught them because he tried to reach them to understand what was going to happen, but they were misunderstanding it. And then he was able to share with them and change the, and correct their thinking. When they saw Jesus again, they were revived and they ran. Those two men, they ran back seven miles to Jerusalem to tell the others. They went. Seven miles is a long way. Have you ever run seven miles? It's, it's, uh, it's long, right? If you're not accustomed to it, it can be very difficult. I haven't run seven miles in many, many, many years. Um, don't think I could do it right now. No, I know I couldn't. I could walk it, but I couldn't run it. They ran. They went. And they told the others. They didn't keep it to themselves. That stagnation that had started to set in, you know, that poisoning of that, that spiritual growth by his death, it was gone in a flash, like a dam had been broken. Imagine how different the story would be if the men had just been astonished at Christ's appearance, had celebrated with a big meal, and then just gone to sleep. Amazing things. He's alive. Praise the Lord. And then, and then kept it to themselves. Would the story have been different for them? Would the story have been different for those back in the upper room if they had kept the good news to themselves? These two men were the second and third people to see Jesus in the flesh after the resurrection. The others back in Jerusalem, they were still in doubt. Verse 11 again, it says, And their words seemed to him like idle tales, and they did not believe them. They didn't, they didn't believe that he had risen. What a different situation it might have been had they not gone and told people. But they did. They ran. They didn't keep it to themselves and they didn't sleep on it. They told others and we know, you know, if you remember, some of you may be too young for that, Paul Harvey with the rest of the story. We know the rest of the story now. Of what happened. So circling back to that other question I had, what about your story? Right now, I think the church is turning the corner. There are, there are pockets within our church that are doing the Lord's work and it can be done in spite of the Aikens in the camp. But I'm going to ask you this question. Are you the same person today that you were six months ago? Are you the same person today you were 12 months ago? I'm a, kind of a glass half full person. right? I like to hear and think of good things. I like encouragements and I like to, to be a blessing to others. Maybe this message is kind of a blessing. But are we stagnant? Are you stagnant from the pressures and the indecision? Or maybe it's super easy for you right now. Things have kind of stabilized. And so there's no pressure. Things are good. Or are some of you so busy trying to make up for lost time? So busy that you are stagnant in your walk with the Lord. <clears throat> so for some of you right here in the congregation I know some of you watching online that is not the case you are not stagnant because we're making plans we're doing the work of the Lord we're reaching out to the community I invite each of you here if you're not a member of the church find an opportunity to reach out to someone Jesus' method was to go and mingle among them find opportunities if you need help you need material you need something from this church please speak to me, speak to us. We're here to help. That's what this church needs to be, a light to the community, a light in your community, a light where you live. By God's grace, this little church here, it's a stone that gathers no moss, but that can't make us individually stagnant living off the work of the collective church. There's much work still to be done and it needs to be done by all of us because each of us have a work to do. We're members of the body, right? A body has to have all of its members working together effectively, healthily, in order to do the work. And each one of you are a piece of that body. And when you're missing, you're not here, you are missed. 
It's like having an injured foot. How many of you have ever injured your pinky toe? Yeah? You don't know you need it until it hurts. I stubbed my toe one night going from the bathroom into the bed, and it was my little toe. And you don't really give it much thought until it hurts. And then you realize, I don't really have a great balance on that foot if I don't have my little toe to help me. You know when you lean on it because it hurts. If I'm the little toe and I'm not doing my work, everyone will know. Everyone will feel it because I will be not supporting the body. And that's not to put pressure on you because everyone's situation is different. We're all going through different points and phases in our lives. But the church is for sick people, right? It's kind of like a spiritual hospital for, for us to come and connect with the Lord corporately to be strengthened because the struggles of the world are still out there waiting for us. The entire world has been assaulted in, by the impact of the last few years. The economy is still struggling. Thousands, literally not that long ago, thousands of people lost their jobs. They're losing their homes. They've lost loved ones. They're still feeling the pain of that. Maybe they're still dealing with illness. I know long COVID is still impacting some people. We have a church member who's still dealing with the effects of Many Adventists have become stagnant with fear or indecision or even the lack of empathy to others or possibly they have this righteous indignation. There's, the world is pretty divided right now, right? If we don't go mingle among others, we won't realize how much we actually have in common. We all want to provide for our families. We all want to feel love and be loved. We all want to know someone cares about us. But the world, the Satan, is really doing his best effort to divide us on so many points and so many levels. And as Adventists, we can be drawn into that. We can be caught up in this push and pull of religion and the world, and we can become in one of the two camps. It's difficult, but if we keep our eyes focused on the Lord, some people are just mad at society. I know people that are just mad. Everything just makes them mad people doing that and them doing this and that draws in that, oh, if they only knew, we should love them. We should love them enough to help them and to show them that Christ loves them. If they see us as enemies, they won't want to hear what we have to say. That's why we go and we mingle among them, desiring their good. We're not their enemy. We're the conduit the Lord has to reach them to save them. Some are even chasing the devil in this false prophecy that's out there and all of these righteous causes. They may seem right, and they may actually feel right, but what are we charged to be doing? To sharing Christ's message with them, to reaching them so that the Lord can do the work in their hearts. All of this, these events of the last three and a half years or so, they've had an impact on how we see the world and our place in it. Some may still be asking ourselves, where do we go? Where do we go from here? The world is so different from what it was just a few years back. Those are the lost years, I call them, because so much happened. So many plans that were being made just brushed aside. We had so many plans in our church. It took us a long time to get our feet back under us and start doing the Lord's work, but praise the Lord, we are. I don't know about you, but I did. I had a major shift in my thinking. I changed jobs last year. Um, not because of the effects of COVID necessarily, but probably in spite of it. It wasn't to withdraw, though my job is fully remote from home, praise the Lord. But it helped me to refocus my efforts to help people. That's my job now. Not like you as a person individually necessarily, but I try through my influence to help people. But that's my work. But it's, it's this inside of me when I saw so much pain and struggle in the world over the last few years, I want to help people. I think it's the Lord trying to use me in some way, as feeble as I am at times and as undesirable as I am or as I get to want to go talk to people. I want to help people. That's kind of that push um, to go and do that work. It's helped me in the church to kind of be more, I wouldn't say vocal because I was that way before, but more focused on encouraging each one of you to have a personal ministry and to not rely on the church itself to reach the people because each one of us has the opportunity to reach one. There was a saying, I can't remember how back it goes, we can't help everyone, but everyone can help someone. 
every one of us can help someone. If you if you go back on our YouTube page and you listen to some of my the last few messages, it's all about personal ministry and how that will keep us moving forward to not become stagnant. When I speak up here during personal ministries, that's the encouragement. It's to be moving forward, not to be stagnant. So that's my encouragement to use, to keep moving forward. Ellen White says this in First Testimonies, page 144. She says, It is our privilege to have faith and salvation. The power of God has not decreased. His power, I saw, would be just as freely bestowed now as formerly the early church. It is the church of God that has lost their faith to claim their energy to wrestle, as did Jacob, crying, I will not let thee go except thou bless me. Enduring faith has been dying away. It must be revived again in the hearts of God's people. There must be a claiming of the blessing of God. Faith, living faith, always bears upward to God in glory. Unbelief, downward to darkness and death. The same book, First Testimonies, page 99, she says, Souls around us must be aroused and saved or they perish. Not a moment have we to lose. We all have an influence that tells for the truth or against it. Young people, you have a huge opportunity to influence adults. We have one ministry in the church, if you don't know, it's called the Boxman Ministries. It was started by a couple of our young, youngest members, and it's, it's grown to include all of our youngest members. It's amazing what a young person can do to touch the heart of an adult. If you don't know what it is, talk to Eric and Lisa. Talk to Jose and Catherine. They know what it is. Uh, if you want to, I mean, it's amazing to see because the, young, the Bible tells us the young people will be the ones who finish the work. They will be the ones who prophesy. <clears throat> we all have an influence that tells for the truth or against it. I desire to carry with me unmistakable evidences that I am one of Christ's disciples. Praise the Lord. I don't have the answers to society's ills, right? Other than knowing that everyone needs Jesus. I think that would be the cure. We know the end society, when he comes back, will be perfect because everyone will know Jesus. But starting with yourself, because it's the only person that, that can change you, it's the only person that you can truly change, even, Continue to look for ways to make an impact for God. Look and let these circumstances help you develop new skills and learn new ways to connect. If you're shy about talking to someone face-to-face, do you have social media? I mean, it's prevalent. I don't necessarily. I have LinkedIn. I use it to kind of read stories about my work um, and, and articles. But if you have social media, there's an opportunity there to reach someone. Jose's been talking about some outreach efforts using social media, but we have few laborers willing to step in and help. If you want to help, talk to Jose, talk to me. We want to start reaching others through means that, of where they are, and they aren't always here. So if you want to be involved in that way, let us know. Use these circumstances, these challenges that we face today to encourage others and to lift them up, because there's probably someone in the same scenario you're in. Maybe there's a quiet person who likes to stay home a lot, who doesn't get out much. Maybe you know them. You can encourage them. Maybe you can offer, cook them a meal, mow their grass. I don't know. Find a way. Encourage them so you don't become stagnant. Reach out. It can mean the difference between your success and failure. It can mean the difference between someone else's success and failure. Challenges when faced with an attitude of prayer and a desire to develop yourself, they bring on the greatest periods of growth. You know, when the church was under adversity, it grew like wildfire. I hesitate to pray for adversity sometimes because it's painful. You know, be careful what you pray for. When you pray for patience, the Lord's going to give you opportunity to exercise patience. If you pray for growth, he's probably going to give you opportunities to grow through adversity. Let's sing our closing song. Your Holy Spirit would help us provide means and opportunity to share what we have received with others. 
Help us not be stagnant pools. Help us be flowing living waters. Bless us each one, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.